Hello, this is Douglas Rombaugh, and in this video I want to talk about learning styles. Now, I have a view on learning styles that is interestingly interesting in that if you look at the actual uh, research surrounding learning styles, near as I can tell, uh, my view is not terribly controversial. Uh, however, in academic settings, it seems to be quite controversial. So <laughs> this should be rather interesting. Now I want to preface this discussion by saying that I have not read a huge amount about this. I'm speaking more in terms of the learning style theories as are instantiated in common practice. So I haven't read the original papers or anything like that, but I have sat through all the trainings and that is the thing that I am going to be talking about. So I don't have a terribly nuanced view of the original theories, and it's entirely possible that the original theories address some of my concerns. Uh, my, my main goal here is to speak to these learning styles in practice, more so than in theory. Now on top of that, this is an opinion piece. I don't have formal data to back up anything that I'm saying here. This is all based on my own experience and anecdotal evidence. So do bear both of those things in mind. Uh, this is less me telling you how things are and more me telling you what I think about the way things are. And I'd love to hear about your opinions in the comments as well, right? Uh, in many ways, I'm kind of opening this up, airing this in a fairly public forum so that I can see counter arguments to my points and things like that. There's a time, or there comes a time when you're thinking about something that you kind of need to put it out there. Otherwise, you just end up in this cycle of, I'm so brilliant because I have this great insight that nobody else understands, and I'm not going to tell anyone, and then it's not going to get attacked, and then I'm so brilliant, and you, you end up in this big cycle thing here, right? So in order to truly, truly come to an informed opinion about something, there comes a time where you have to actually talk about it and risk being told off. So that's what I'm doing. Please let me know what you think. Uh, I'd, I'd be very interested in hearing whether you agree, disagree, what you agree with, what you disagree with, if you think I'm an idiot, any of that. So what I have here pulled up on screen is a, it's the first um, result when you search learning styles in DuckDuckGo. And it's fairly standard fare as far as this goes. Obviously there are a lot of different learning style theories and this is just one of them. Uh, specifically, this is um, VARC Modalities by Fleming and Mills, which encompasses, uh, what is this? It's uh, Visual, Auditory, Reading, and Kinesthetic is what VARC stands for. And so those are the four here. You have Visual Learners, Auditory Learners, Kinesthetic Learners, and Reading slash Writing Learners. Now the theory for these different styles of learning goes something to the effect of if you take a classroom full of students, or indeed a group of people just in general, uh, you're going to be able to filter them based on the way in which they're best able to learn. So some people are going to learn better when information is presented to them in the form of diagrams or pictures, things like that. That would be visual learners. You have people who are going to learn better when the information is explained to them. You have people who are going to learn better, or that would be auditory learners, where they hear it. Uh, you have people who are going to learn better when they're able to act out the information in some way. That would be a kinesthetic learner. And then you have reading and writing who learn well from, from books. So these are the four styles of learning. Now, of course, you're not going to be able to cleanly divide a person and say that person is strictly visual and that person is strictly auditory and so on, right? These are these are spectrums and you fall somewhere. You can imagine like a slider. You have a visual slider, an auditory slider, a kinesthetic slider, and a reading slider. And you can fall at different places on that bar for each one. But the general idea is that people are going to learn better when information is presented in different ways. Now, what winds up happening sometimes in practice is you end up with literal filtering where you say, all right, well, we're going to classify our students based on particular attributes and we're going to present visual information to the visual learners and auditory to the auditory and so on and so forth. 
Fortunately, that's not something that I have um, directly experienced, but it is something that I've I've heard tell actually happens in some places, which is, who. So anyway, my thesis here, to put it bluntly, is that this learning styles content here is either not terribly meaningful or bullshit. You could go one way or the other. Uh, obviously, there is there's something to it, right? It makes sense. There there is something here. But I don't think that it is a terribly useful distinction to make when your goal is actually to help people learn things. Now, why is that the case? Well, I'm going to lay out an argument in this video for why that is the case, why I think the way that I do. And the general structure of the argument is going to look something like this. I'm going to take a particular skill that you might be interested in learning and I'm going to demonstrate, hopefully fairly uh, conclusively, that of the four learning styles, three of them make absolutely no sense under any circumstance as a way to learn that particular skill. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the jump, the generalization step, and say that that skill is actually no different from any other skill that you'd want to learn and therefore, as a means of learning any skill you would want to learn, three of these four learning styles make no sense. Now, obviously, as is the case with most arguments, I think, um, unless I make some horrible deductive error, uh, the most obvious attack route is going to be to try and attack that inductive step, to try and attack that generalization of from this skill to all the skills. And I'd be very interested in hearing your thoughts on on the uh, veracity of that particular line of argumentation. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's actually get to the argument. So the skill, I'll admit I'm picking low-hanging fruit here. Uh, the skill that I'm going to take as the basis of my argument here is uh, playing a musical instrument. Now you could make an exact, the exact same argument just as obviously for a lot of things, uh, say dancing or playing a sport, right? And these are these are more physical, but you could, uh, as we'll see when I make that generalization step, that apl the, as applies to physical skills also applies to uh, less obviously physical skills. And I hope I can make that point clearly. But anyway, we're going to start with playing a musical instrument. So we're going to lay out models for lear potentially learning to play a musical instrument structured predominantly around uh, a theory of teaching to a visual learner, an auditory learner, a kinesthetic learner, and a reading and writing learner. So for a visual learner, right, if you if you want to present playing a musical instrument visually, that's not too difficult to do, right? And I, I would dare say that visual learners, it's so far as the category exists, would have a much easier time with something like sheet music, right? Reading sheet music, because that's a very visu visual uh, form of information content. So you might teach them to read sheet music, um, demonstrate to them what it looks like. I'm a trumpet player, so I'm going to, my, my playing a musical instrument is going to consist of moving these three fingers, but <laughs> you get the idea. It, it generalizes to all of them. Show them what each individual thing looks like and how to play each note. You might um, you might demonstrate playing the instrument for them so they can see what it looks like. And you you get to a point right where if you if you view the set of facts that's that constitutes the field of playing a musical instrument, you visually teach through these visual processes every fact that is relevant to playing a musical instrument to the student in question. So they, and, and they, they actually know it, right? You can test them on it, do a sort of a call and response sort of thing, and they know all the facts. So they've learned the set of facts surrounding playing a particular musical instrument. Maybe they can even mime out all of the different movements that would be necessary to make the different sounds. And having done this, having fully taught the set of facts surrounding playing a musical instrument, you give them a musical instrument and you tell them to play it. Now what's going to happen? Well, I don't think it takes much of a 
uh, an imagine a much of an imagination to figure out what's going to happen. It's not going to go well. We could take a look at auditory learners same way. And now, in the case of an auditory learner, it would probably make more sense to teach, say, playing an instrument by ear as opposed to reading sheet music. Right? That makes sense because sheet music is a very visual medium. An auditory learner would probably be able, would probably be more attuned to listening to it. So let's let's allow that. We'll we'll teach, try and teach playing by ear. You could teach them what all the uh, teach them what all the notes are supposed to sound like. Teach them perhaps how they can listen to the music and figure out what note that is, and then explain to them all the ways that they can make those sounds. Right. And again, same idea. We'll show them the full set of facts surrounding, or rather, tell them or explain to them auditorily the full set of facts surrounding playing a musical instrument and then set them loose on a musical instrument. And again, I would posit that the outcome of that particular strategy is not going to be very good. They're not going to be particularly good at playing a musical instrument, even though they know the full set of facts that surrounds that particular skill. And they've learned, they've learned it auditorily. Let's skip down to four uh, for reading and writing learners. Again, let's grab all of the books that we can imagine on how to play a musical instrument and throw, throw our prospective student at these works of writing. And they can read all of the books and learn all of the facts from the books, maybe write a few essays about it, what have you. Uh, and, and yeah, once they've read all the books, We'll hand the musical instrument to them and see how well they do. Again, the outcome is not going to be so great. So in all three of those, I am, you can you can imagine how those particular techniques would be useful, but in and of themselves, they're not sufficient. Obviously, if you're going to learn to play a musical instrument, there is a reading component that is necessary. Well, I honestly, actually, um, the reading component for, for music is probably least necessary. It's helpful. But there is definitely an auditory component because we're talking about something that makes noise. And there's a visual component, particu particularly if you're interested in being able to read music. Uh, there's a visual component as well. But how does one actually learn how to play a musical instrument in practice? You hand the student a damn instrument and you have them make noises with it, right? You learn to play a musical instrument by playing a musical instrument. There's no substitute for actually sitting down with, say, the trumpet or the violin or the piano or whatever and going through the motions of playing it. You can read about playing an instrument all you want. You can listen to lectures on playing instruments. You can listen to music played on the instrument you're trying to learn. And all those things are helpful. But if you want to learn the skill of playing a musical instrument, you have to actually pick up the instrument and play with it. Right? That's the only way. Now, obviously, there are perhaps exceptions at the extreme end of the distribution of truly, truly talented musical people who can do that, where they can pick pick up the uh, the facts that they've learned from say a book or listening or whatever sit down with a random instrument and actually do stuff with it but in education we're not super concerned with with the extreme end of the distribution the extreme positive end of the distribution right because those sorts of people are probably going to be just fine without without us they'll they're just fine to figure this stuff out on their own the real goal of education as I see it anyway is to target those people in the middle and give them the necessary skills to function. And so accepting those true genius musicians, say, you're going to have to actually handle the damn instrument if you want to learn how to play it. And you can see how that same argument would apply to any kinesthetic activity, any physical activity, that the only real way to learn that is kinesthetically. You have to actually kick the soccer ball around before you can make a goal. You have to practice throwing a basketball at the hoop. You have to practice your rise and fall in waltz if you're into dance, right? There's no substitute for actual practice, actually physically doing the thing. And that makes a lot of sense, right? 
if we're talking about largely kinesthetic activities, well, how do you learn to do a kinesthetic activity? Kinesthetically. And so then you might think, well, okay, well, that argument works fine for kinesthetic stuff, but what about traditional academic topics, right? When you go to college, the vast majority of people who go to college don't go to college to learn a musical instrument, or they don't go to college to learn soccer. Um, they may play a musical instrument or play soccer, but they're probably studying something else. Even music majors, um, a lot of music majors don't major in performance, say they'll major in other aspects of music, which perhaps you might think would be better served by some of these other approaches. And already you can kind of see that, well, maybe there's a, a slight problem with this whole learning style thing, because it does seem as though certain topics may be better served by certain styles. And maybe the learning style is more a function of the topic that you're trying to study than it is the actual thing, or than it is the person who's doing the studying. You know, maybe that could be the case. Uh, and to a, a small degree, I do think that might be the case. But my argument is a bit stronger than that. So let's take that, let's do that generalization now. And I'm going to do it by way of example. Let's take some more traditional academic topics. I teach math and computer science, so let's grab uh, mathematics and programming as two examples. And I'll, I'll touch on some of the more liberal arts topics as well here, too. Programming. Now, in the sense of kinesthetic learners, um, how to cater to kinesthetic learners. So in the sense of, say, incorporating movement into lessons, games that involve moving around, things like that. Programming is not something like that, right? Programming is done sitting in front of a computer. You move your fingers, but there's not a, there's not a substantial physical movement component. Most of, the, most of the work in programming happens, happens in your head. With that said, you can grab a book on programming. Um, do I have one? Oh, yeah, of course I have one in easy reach. You can grab a book on programming. I don't know. Haven't actually read this one yet, but sure. This is a slightly more advanced programming book, I assume. But you can grab a book on programming, and all the books on programming, and you can read them all, right? Now, I have never, in my admittedly rather short life, encountered a student who is capable of reading the programming textbook, learning, again, learning the set of facts surrounding programming, even if they actually would learn them rather well, being able to just sit down, having memorized that set of facts, and actually write a program that wasn't really simple and trivial. So such a, pro such a programmer, a hypothetical programmer who has, say, learned from reading the book, might be able to just sit down and write a program, you know, like a simple accept two command line arguments, add them together, and display the result. Sure. But if you asked the programmer to, having read all of these books, to sit down and, say, from scratch, implement a login and authentication system, which is still relatively simple. It's not that complicated of a thing, especially in isolation they would probably struggle immensely. If you, if you asked said programmer to figure out how many prime numbers are there less than a million, unless that specific example was in one of the books they read, they'd probably struggle immensely, even though they know all the facts surrounding the field. They know what a prime number is. They know what a while loop is. They know what a for loop is. They know an if statement. They know all the facts, but they can't actually perform the skill. So how do you learn to perform the skill? You write programs. I'm going to generalize here and say that this act of writing the programs, of practicing the skill of programming, is kinesthetic, right? You're actually doing something. Even if the something you're doing is largely in your head, you're acting out the skill. You are practicing the skill. So you may have a programming student who can learn the facts of programming better by reading them in the book, or by hearing them aloud, or by seeing a diagram. 
But given those facts, the only way that you can actually learn the skill of programming is to apply those facts in practice, to sit down and write programs and struggle through it, fail, fail, fail again, and then finally get something working. And all those lessons that you learn from your failures, which in many ways are going to be personal to you and therefore not easy to pick up in a book, say, those are what's going to teach you the skill of programming, the act of actually doing it. So mathematics, mathematics is the exact same way. And it actually, in my view, doesn't matter whether you see mathematics as a rote set of procedures, of calculations to perform, at, say a tool, or if you see mathematics in the perhaps more sophisticated sense as a creative activity involving the application of logic and reasoning to a set of a set of problems. It doesn't matter which one of those views you take. It's the same idea. And this one I can speak to you from personal experience because this is something I bashed my head against in graduate school real hard. Was I was not a particularly good <laughs> graduate student in the sense that when it came time for exams, I would basically fall back on reading and writing. So I would study for these exams, which were predominantly math problems, you know, math problems, perhaps in a physical context, but math problems, by making sure that I could basically recite from, by reading and then recite out all of the necessary facts. And I could do the simple problems, right? But the problem would always arise that when I sat down to actually do the exam, the problems on the exam were structured in such a way that there was always a snag that you would hit, right? They weren't just the simple run the procedure you've memorized. They would require a little bit of, a little bit of something extra. And they're designed that way because that's the point, is they want you to actually understand, not just be able to run the rote procedures. And you test that by taking, by making problems that break the rote procedures but can be fixed as long as you actually know what the hell you're doing. And of course, because I hadn't practiced, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I could run the procedure, but the moment it deviated, I was completely lost because I didn't have the experience of dealing with these problems as they arose. And of course, when you're on the exam, when a problem like that comes up and you have 20 minutes to dedicate to this one problem, it doesn't work so well, right? Those are the, These are the sorts of problems that you think about for a day or two before you can come up with a solution to them in general until you're experienced. And how do you get that experience? You don't read about solving the problems. You work all the practice problems. You work all the exercises in the back of the textbook. And you hit upon these problems and you get skilled at dealing with them. When the procedure breaks, you understand how it broke and how to fix it. And you, you can't get that by just memorizing the rote procedure by, say, reading the book, right? You have to practice and actually experience it and get used to resolving these problems. So math is the same way. You don't learn math from a book. You learn math by taking a pencil and a piece of paper and doing math, particularly difficult math. Okay. So I... So my argument then would be that topics like programming and math are as much a kinesthetic skill as things like um, like playing an instrument or dancing or playing a sport, in which case the way that you learn to do them is by doing them. Who would have thought? Memorizing the set of facts surrounding the discipline does not make you skilled in that discipline, even in something like programming or math. Okay. So what about, what about history, history or literature? Surely, surely those are topics that would be best handled, or rather, surely those are topics which you could actually learn given some of these other potential learning styles, right? So surely you can visually or auditorily re learn history, or you can learn history from a book. And superficially, yeah, sure. If your view of history is a set of facts about events that happened in the past, 
Sure. You can learn a set of events or set of facts about events that happened in the past by reading, or you can learn it by listening to lectures or looking at diagrams and timelines and things like that. But again, history is not just a set of facts about events that happened in the past, right? History is a process. It's as much a process as mathematics is. To actually learn history, ask any historian, to actually learn history is not to learn a set of facts. It's a skill. Now, the practice of that skill takes the form of constructing arguments based on primary source data, of writing papers and books and giving lectures and talks about topics to try and tease out the historical nuance, right? It's different. You're not sitting down and solving a math problem, but, and, and, the, and I should say the practice of doing it looks different, but it is still an active practice. It's an activity that you perform. And knowing that set of facts is helpful, but it's not sufficient. Again, if you want to really learn history, you have to do the process. And the only way to do the process is just to do it. You can read about historical analysis all you want, but until you've actually done it, you don't know history. Same thing for literature, right? English lit, same idea. Languages, how do you learn a language? Do you read a book? Like if I were to sit down and, and read and perhaps even memorize, all the information in this book. Would I be a, able to fluently speak Latin? Hell no. How do, you, how do you learn to speak a language or even read a language or write in it? You speak it, you read it, you write in it. Kinesthetically, you practice. And again, it's not kinesthetics in the sense of I'm going to pick things up and put them down 500 times, but it is still kinesthetic in the sense that you're doing something. You're acting it out. I'll just deal with that later. So that's my main point here. There are four, according to this theory, there, uh, there are varying other theories, but there are these learning styles. But I don't actually think that anybody can truly learn something by any technique other than kinesthetically. I think that the only way that you can truly learn a topic is by actually doing that topic, by acting out that skill and practicing it in that way. And I think that if you restrict yourself, as people often do when they, when they learn about these theories, they're like, oh, well, I'm a visual learner. So I'm gonna learn by looking at pictures and drawing pictures and diagramming and all that. It's like, yeah, okay, that's a useful thing, but it's not sufficient. And if you, if you lock yourself into that category of visual learner, or auditory learner, or reading and writing learner, you're never going to actually be able to learn the thing. So will be like me in graduate school, locked in on, well, I learn by reading, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really learn this topic by reading it, rather than by working all the example problems. And then you're going to pay for it later, because you haven't actually learned the topic. I think... I think probably the the point of disagreement that I have with these learning style theories it probably boils down to the definition of the word learning. So what I mean by this is if your definition of learning basically amounts to the learning of facts, then this makes sense. So say in a particular educational context, I'm the teacher, you're the student, and in a particular moment, the goal of that moment is for me, the teacher, to transfer the fact that the Battle of Hastings occurred in the year 1066 from my brain into your brain. So that's the goal right now. And if that goal is achieved, if that, that fact knowledge transfer happens, we can say that you've learned something. If that's your view of learning, then sure. Some people are going to have an easier time remembering that statement of fact if it is presented to them orally, if I say it aloud. 
Some are going to understand it better if they read it. Or some are going, I, I, there, I'm even using the word understanding. Some are going to remember it better if they read it. Some are going to remember it better if it is presented, say, in a diagram as a timeline showing exactly where it is with 1066 labeled on the diagram. Hell, some people may remember it better if you dress up in, in costume and reenact the battle. Sure. There's your different learning styles. But if your view on learning is restricted to the transference of facts from one brain to another or from a book to a brain, I think that's a pretty bad view of learning. That's a pretty bad definition of learning, right? Because it's, it's, it's a lot, education is a lot deeper than that. And any skill worth doing is not going to be able to be encapsulated in a set of facts. Uh, this is why standardized testing fails miserably. Say standardized science testing. What is standardized science testing? Well, we're going to ask you a bunch of multiple choice questions about a set of facts. O okay. And yeah, maybe you'll learn those facts real well, but that set of facts isn't science, right? Science is the process by which those facts are teased out. The fact that the Battle of Hastings was fought in the year 1066, that's not history. That's a fact that was teased out by the process of historical analysis. 2 plus 2 equals 4. All right? Solve this equation for x. That's not math. That's just an application of the skill of doing math. So, yeah. So that's my thought. Those are my thoughts on these learning styles. I don't think that they are the best way to conceptualize the learning process because I don't think that they're applicable to actually learning the majority of things in which you might want to learn. I think that if you want to learn how to do something, the only way to do that is to actually do that something. In a sense, the only of these learning styles that has any real merit as a, as a way of learning something is the kinesthetic approach. Obviously, in order to do a skill, there are a set of facts which are necessary to learn. And some people may do better at memorizing that set of facts by reading them or by hearing them or through diagrams or, or what have you. But to call those, but to call the process of memorizing those facts learning, I think greatly undersells what learning is. Uh, and it's part of the process, but not the process in its entirety. And so by all means, it's important to present information, facts, in ways, in a variety of different ways when you're teaching so that people who remember it better visually and auditorily and by reading can all grapple with that those facts and have a good chance at actually memorizing those facts. But at the end of the day, the facts and that whole process is subsidiary to actual learning, which I think has to, just by necessity, it has to be done kinesthetically for, at the very least, for the vast majority of people. And to lock yourself into a particular mode of learning based on these is to cripple your ability to actually learn anything. Because you're going to have to do it kinesthetically if you want to learn it. And all these other points, all these other processes, visual, auditory, reading, are all also important for actually learning the facts. So those are my thoughts on, on learning styles. Um, I'd love to hear what you have to say about them. Do you think I'm being an idiot? Do you think I have a point? I don't know. Let me know what you think. Um, I hope that you found this interesting, and I'll see you in the next one.